Hi there and welcome to another chemistry video. I'm Jeremy Krug. If you've been following along with my thermodynamics videos in this series of AP Chemistry, we've been learning about different ways to calculate delta H, the change in enthalpy of a reaction. We've learned about bond enthalpies, We've learned about uh, enthalpy of formation and products minus reactants. We've learned about Hess's law. Well, in this video, we're learning about the last way to determine the heat change of a system, and that is the experimental way. Now, all these other ways that we've learned are basically ways that we can use uh, data and constants to figure out uh, delta H. But here we're actually going to carry out experiments. And so this is how we would do this in the laboratory. We're using the equation Q equals MC delta T. Now you may have learned this in first year chemistry, but if not, that's okay too, because here we're going to learn how this works. Now Q is the amount of heat, thermal energy, that's been absorbed or released. And that's going to be calculated in joules, the SI unit of heat energy. Now M is the mass of the object. That's going to be in grams. Now C is the specific heat capacity of the material, and that's going to be given to us in joules per gram degree Celsius. Now when we say specific heat capacity, what does that actually mean? Because sometimes we talk about that as being a, a constant that's unique to every single material. Well, I like to say that specific heat capacity is a way to measure how well a material resists temperature change. How well a material resists temperature change. So to illustrate that, let's say that you're going to cook a perhaps some uh, spaghetti, and you need to boil some water to do this. So if you take a big pot of water and put that on the stove, and you, you turn the stove on you know, for a while, after, let's say 30 seconds after you turn that stove on, you put your finger into the water in that pot. Are you going to get burned? Well, no you're not, are you? Because water takes a fairly long time to heat up. It has a high specific heat capacity. It resists temperature change. On the other hand, let's say 30 seconds after you turn on that stove, or light the stove, you decide to touch the bottom of the pot. Are you going to get burned? I would say yes you will, because of the metal, you know, the aluminum or the copper or, the, or whatever material, that metallic material that you're uh, using in that pot, it has a very low specific heat capacity. So it heats up very quickly. It has a very low resistance to temperature change. That's what specific heat capacity or specific heat is all about. How well something resists temperature change. Now delta T is the change in temperature of the material. And that's going to be found by taking the final temperature and subtracting the initial temperature. And that can be in degrees Celsius. You'll find that if you do that in Kelvins, it's going to give you the same answer. So degrees Celsius or Kelvins are actually interchangeable for this particular, uh, for this particular uh, e equation. We're going to do a few examples with this. Let's say we have uh, specific heat capacity, first of all. But let's talk about different materials. Uh, I've tried to organize this from the highest to some of the lowest here. And of course, this is just a, a selection of different materials that we might use in our class or in our homework assignments or in the problems here. But as you can see, liquid water has a very high specific heat capacity, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And I guess that's a good way to illustrate that you know the water in that pot takes quite a while to heat up, doesn't it? And likewise, it would also take quite a while to cool down. If you look at the metals like iron and aluminum and especially mercury and gold and lead, these have very low specific heat capacities. That means that they heat up very quickly, they cool down very quickly. They have a very low resistance to temperature change. Now, let's do an example here. Here we have a 60.0 gram piece of aluminum metal that experiences a rise in temperature from 20 degrees Celsius to 52.5 degrees Celsius. If the specific heat capacity of aluminum is 0.897 joules per gram degree Celsius, how much heat energy was absorbed 
by the aluminum. Well, once again, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T to solve this problem. And we're going to plug and chug into the equation. Q is how many joules. And guess what? That's what the question is asking. It says how much heat energy. So we're solving for Q in this problem. Now M is the mass of the aluminum. And it is 60 grams. We see that right from the problem. So we're going to plug in 60 grams. Now C is the specific heat. And for aluminum it says it's 0.897 joules per gram degree Celsius. So I'm going to plug that in for C. Now delta T is the change in temperature. That's the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So the final temperature was 52.5 degrees Celsius and the initial was 20 degrees Celsius. So when you subtract that you see that the temperature went up by 32.5 degrees Celsius. So that's why we put 32.5 in for delta T. And now all we have to do is the arithmetic. So 60 times 0.897 times 32.5. And I get that Q is about 1,750 joules. So that's just a simple example here with Q equals MC delta T. Let's try another example that's a little bit more complex. Here we have silver. And silver has a specific heat capacity of 0.233 joules per gram degree Celsius. A one ounce bar of silver has a mass of 31.1 grams and an initial temperature of 20.7 degrees Celsius. If 192 joules of heat escape from the silver bar to the surroundings, what will be the, what will be the final temperature of the silver? Well, it's the same type of problem here. So we're going to use Q equals MC delta T. Now Q is our amount of heat. So that's given to us here. It's 192 joules. But notice that the joules are escaping. They're leaving. So that's going to be negative 192 joules in this example. Now M is the mass. It has a mass in grams of 31.1 grams. So that goes in for M. C is the specific heat. That's point 233 joules per gram degree Celsius and delta T is the change in temperature. So it's final minus initial. We're trying to find the final temperature. And it says what will be the final temperature so we're going to have that as our unknown and the initial temperature is 20.7 degrees Celsius. So we have that you know, final minus the initial 20.7. Now we just have a math problem to, to solve here. So we can uh, do that, you know, take the negative 192, uh, divide by the product of 31.1 times 0.233, and I get negative 26.5 equals T sub F minus 20.7, and add 20.7 to both sides, and I get that the final temperature is actually negative 5.8 degrees Celsius. So we can use Q equals MC delta T to solve in these problems. Let's try another example that's a little bit more complex still. This time, we have a couple things going on here. We have a 5.00 gram piece of iron that's heated in an oven, and then it's dropped into a cup containing 155 grams of water at 21 degrees Celsius. The specific heat of iron is 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, and the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. If the temperature of the water rises to 22.9 degrees Celsius, what was the initial temperature of the hot iron? So notice there's a lot going on here. We have a piece of hot iron that we've heated up and we drop it into cold water. And there's going to be some change in, in temperature here. There's going to be a transfer of heat. Now, when you take something that's hot and drop it into something that's cold, we've learned in an earlier lesson that the heat is transferred from the thing that's hot to the thing that's cooler. So uh, the heat that's lost by the hot thing is equal to the heat that's gained by the colder thing which is the water in this case. So this is just a little mathematical expression of what I just said. The Q, or the joules, 
that are lost by the iron will be equal to the Q or the joules that are gained by the water. So we can use that little equation right there to solve. Now we've learned that Q equals MC delta T. So I'm just going to algebraically sub that in here. I'm going to take this and we have negative MC delta T of the iron is equal to the positive MC delta T of the water. And so now we can just plug and chug into that equation here. So M, the mass of the iron is 5.00 grams. So I'm going to take that and plug it in there. We got the negative sign for that in front of the M. Now the C is the specific heat of the iron. And it says that that is 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that goes in there for C of the iron. Now the delta T of the iron, this one's a little tricky here. The final temperature of the iron minus initial temperature. Now we're trying to find the initial temperature. That's what the question's asking. What was the initial temperature? Do we know the final temperature of the iron? I think we do. Even though the problem doesn't come right out and say it, we can figure it out. It says that you have this hot iron has a very high temperature and you drop it into cold water. Now when you do that, the temperature of the hot iron is going to drop and the temperature of the cold water is going to rise. And when are they going to stop? Well, we've learned in an earlier lesson they're going to stop moving when they get to be at the same temperature. So I think we, we can safely say that the final temperature of the iron is the same as the final temperature of the water. You know, you have the hot thing and the cold thing and they will equilibrate out at the same temperature. So according to the problem, the final temperature of the water is 22.9 degrees Celsius. That's what it says right here. So guess what? That means the final temperature of the iron is also 22.9 degrees Celsius. So my term for delta T of iron is going to look like this. 22.9 degrees Celsius minus that initial temperature that I'm trying to solve for. All right, so that, that, that's a, a long way of saying, you know, that's what the final temperature is. Now let's go to the other side of the equal sign. The mass of the water, M of the water, is 155 grams. So I'm going to put that in here. 155 grams. The C, the specific heat of water, is 4.18 degrees or uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. So that goes in for C. And the delta T of water is a little bit easier to figure out because the final temperature was 22.9. The initial temperature was 21.0. So just subtract those and the temperature of the water went up by 1.9 degrees. So we can plug that in there and you can solve that as well. Now let's do the algebra here. We have some math to do. So let's see, point, uh, negative 5 times 0.449 is negative 2.245. I'm going to maintain that part there as it is and we'll solve that here later. Take 155 times 4.18 times 1.9 and that's 1,231. Now I divide both sides by the negative 2.245 and I get that 22.9 minus the temperature initial is negative 548.3. I subtract 22.9 from both sides and do a sign change. And I get that my initial temperature of the iron was 571 degrees Celsius. So that's a pretty hot oven, isn't it? A very hot piece of iron that we had there. So... Do you see how to solve these problems? Q equals MC delta T. It doesn't seem like we have any chemical reactions going on here. These are physical processes. Uh, in the next video, we're going to learn how to take the, the, the Q that we've learned here and turn that into an actual delta H value for a chemical reaction. Now, before we stop here, how are these experiments carried out? Well, uh, we'd use something called a calorimeter. A calorimeter is an actual physical device in which we carry out these, these processes, these experiments. It looks something like this. Uh, it is basically a cup, and, and usually the easiest and cheapest thing we make it out of is, is polystyrene. I think the commercial name for that is styrofoam. 
uh, and it's just a cup. And if you want to go all out, you can take two styrofoam cups, put one in the other. It costs you all about maybe a nickel, five cents, maybe less to do this. Um, you have a thermometer in there to figure out what the temperature is inside the, the solution there, inside the mixture. We have a stirrer of some kind to stir things around. And we can put a styrofoam cover on top. We don't necessarily have to do that, but that's often done. And when you measure heat transfer through this method, it's called calorimetry. And like I said, this, this is a very cheap and simple way to do this. In fact, if you use a styrofoam cup or two, we, call it a, we, we often actually call this a coffee cup calorimeter because it's actually made out of a, a cheap styrofoam cup. It's very cheap and easy to, to do that to carry out that process, a coffee cup calorimeter. You can buy calorimeters that are much more expensive, but uh, the results, at least in a general chemistry lab or a high school laboratory, are probably not going to give you results that are much better than what you get with just a cheap coffee cup or two. Now, this particular type of calorimetry takes place in an unsealed container. This styrofoam cover uh, allows air to get in and out. And so the pressure inside the calorimeter is the same as the pressure outside the calorimeter in the normal atmospheric air. So this is called constant pressure calorimetry. And so we're able to maintain the same pressure inside as we have outside. There is another type of calorimetry that AP chemistry normally does not cover. That's called constant uh, volume calorimetry and it is it makes use of a different type of calorimeter of calorimeter it's called a, a bomb calorimeter we don't normally do that in AP chemistry if you're in a general chemistry course in college you will learn you will need excuse me to learn how to do that so we can talk about that type of calorimetry separately and that's a, a separate uh, video for a different course, I suppose. I hope you learned something about Q equals MC delta T. Hope you learned how to do these problems. If you liked my video or learned uh, how to work these problems more effectively, please hit that thumbs up button. I uh, hope you have subscribed to my channel. If you haven't already done so, please consider doing so. I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for a long time, over 20 years, and I want to make sure that you get an A in your class and a 5 on the AP Chemistry test if that's what you're planning on taking. Join me again where we will continue our journey through chemistry and learn some more, chem more chemistry together.